Chapter 12 of Humorous Ghost Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Humorous Ghost Stories, selected by Dorothy Scarborough. Chapter 12 The Ghost Ship by Richard Middleton. Fairfield is a little village lying near the Portsmouth Road, about halfway between London and the sea. Strangers, who now and then find it by accident, call it a pretty, old-fashioned place. We who live in it and call it home don't find anything very pretty about it, but we should be sorry to live anywhere else. Our minds have taken the shape of the inn and the church and the green, I suppose. At all events, we never feel comfortable out of Fairfield. Of course the Cockneys, with their vasty houses and noise-ridden streets, can call us rustics if they choose. But for all that, Fairfield is a better place to live in than London. Doctor says that when he goes to London his mind is bruised with the weight of the houses, and he was a Cockney born. He had to live there himself when he was a little chap, but he knows better now. You gentlemen may laugh. Perhaps some of you come from London way, but it seems to me that a witness like that is worth a gallon of arguments. Dull? Well, you might find it dull, but I assure you that I've listened to all the London yarns you have spun tonight, and they're absolutely nothing to the things that happen at Fairfield. It's because of our way of thinking, and minding our own business. If one of your Londoners was set down on the green of a Saturday night when the ghosts of the lads who died in the war kept tryst with the lasses who lie in the churchyard, he couldn't help being curious and interfering, and then the ghosts would go somewhere where it was quieter. But we just let them come and go and don't make any fuss, and in consequence Fairfield is the ghostiest place in all England. Why, I've seen a headless man sitting on the edge of a well in broad daylight, and the children playing about his feet as if he were their father. Take my word for it, spirits know when they are well off as much as human beings. Still, I must admit that the thing I'm going to tell you about was queer even for our part of the world, where three packs of ghost-hounds hunt regularly during the season, and Blacksmith's great-grandfather is busy all night shoeing dead gentlemen's horses. Now that's a thing that wouldn't happen in London, because of their interfering ways. But Blacksmith he lies up aloft and sleeps as quiet as a lamb. Once, when he had a bad head, he shouted down to them not to make so much noise, and in the morning he found an old guinea left on the anvil as an apology. He wears it on his watch-chain now. But I must get on with my story. If I start telling you about the queer happenings at Fairfield, I'll never stop. It all came of the great storm in the spring of ninety-seven, the year that we had two great storms. This was the first one, and I remember it well because I found in the morning that it had lifted the thatch of my pigsty into the widow's garden as clean as a boy's kite. When I looked over the hedge, widow, Tom Lampert's widow it was, was prodding for her nasturtiums with a daisy grubber. After I had watched her for a little I went down to the fox and grapes to tell landlord what she had said to me. Landlord, he laughed being a married man and at ease with the sex. Come to that, he said, the tempest has blowed something into my field. A kind of a ship, I think it would be. I was surprised at that until he explained that it was only a ghost ship, and would do no hurt to the turnips. We argued that it had been blown up from the sea at Portsmouth, and then we talked of something else. There were two slates down at the parsonage and a big tree in Lumley's meadow. It was a rare storm. 
I reckon the wind had blown our ghosts all over England. They were coming back for days afterward with foundered horses, and as footsore as possible, and they were so glad to get back to Fairfield that some of them walked up the street crying like little children. Squire said that his great-grandfather's great-grandfather hadn't looked so dead beat since the Battle of Naseby, and he's an educated man. What with one thing and another, I should think it was a week before we got straight again, and then one afternoon I met the landlord on the green, and he had a worried face. I wish you'd come and have a look at that ship in my field, he said to me. It seems to me it's leaning real hard on the turnips. I can't bear thinking what the missus will say when she sees it. I walked down the lane with him, and, sure enough, there was a ship in the middle of his field, but such a ship as no man had seen on the water for three hundred years, let alone in the middle of a turnip field. It was all painted black, and covered with carvings, and there was a great bay window in the stern, for all the world like the squire's drawing-room. There was a crowd of little black cannon on deck and looking out of her portholes, and she was anchored at each end to the hard ground. I have seen wonders of the world on picture postcards, but I have never seen anything to equal that. She seems very solid for a ghost ship, I said, seeing that landlord was bothered. I should say it's a betwixt and a between, he answered, puzzling it over, but it's going to spoil a matter of fifty turnips, and missus shall want it moved. We went up to her and touched the side and it was as hard as a real ship. Now, there's folks in England would call that very curious, he said. Now, I don't know much about ships, but I should think that that ghost ship weighed a solid two hundred tons, and it seemed to me that she had come to stay. So I felt sorry for the landlord, who was a married man. All the horses in Fairfield won't move her out of my turnips, he said, frowning at her just then we heard a noise on her deck and we looked up and saw that a man had come out of her front cabin and was looking down at us very peaceably he was dressed in a black uniform set off with rusty gold lace and he had a great cutlass by his side in a brass sheath i'm captain bartholomew roberts he said in a gentleman's voice put in for recruits I seem to have brought her rather far up the harbor. Harbor? cried the landlord. Why, you're fifty miles from the sea. Captain Roberts didn't turn a hair. So much as that, is it? he said coolly. Well, it's of no consequence. Landlord was a bit upset at this. I don't want to be unneighborly, he said but I wish you hadn't brought your ship into my field. You see, my wife sets great store on these turnips. The captain took a pinch of snuff out of a fine gold box that he pulled out of his pocket, and dusted his fingers with a silk handkerchief in a very genteel fashion. I'm only here for a few months, he said, but if a testimony of my esteem would pacify your good lady, I should be content and with the words he loosed a great gold brooch from the neck of his coat and tossed it down to the landlord. Landlord blushed as red as a strawberry. I'm not denying she's fond of jewelry, he said, but it's too much for half a sackful of turnips. Indeed it was a handsome brooch. The captain laughed. Tut, man, he said, it's a forced sale and you deserve a good price. Say no more about it, and nodding good day to us, he turned on his heel and went into the cabin. Landlord walked back up the lane like a man with a weight off his mind. That tempest has blowed me a bit of luck, he said. The missus will be main pleased with that brooch. It's better than the blacksmith's guinea any day. Ninety-seven was Jubilee year, the year of the second Jubilee, 
you remember, and we had great doings at Fairfield, so that we hadn't much time to bother about the ghost ship, though, anyhow, it isn't our way to meddle in things that don't concern us. Landlord saw his tenant once or twice when he was hoeing his turnips, and passed the time of day, and landlord's wife wore her new brooch to church every Sunday. But we didn't mix much with the ghosts at any time, all except an idiot lad there was in the village, and he didn't know the difference between a man and a ghost, poor innocent. On Jubilee Day, however, somebody told Captain Roberts why the church bells were ringing, and he hoisted a flag and fired off his guns like a loyal Englishman. Tis true the guns were shotted, and one of the round shot knocked a hole in Farmer Johnstone's barn, but nobody thought much of that in a season of rejoicing. It wasn't till our celebrations were over that we noticed that anything was wrong in Fairfield. Twas Shoemaker who told me first about it one morning at the Fox and Grapes. You know my great-great-uncle, he said to me. You mean Joshua, the quiet lad, I answered knowing him well. "'Quiet,' said the shoemaker, indignantly. "'Quiet, you call him, coming home at three o'clock every morning as drunk as a magistrate and waking up the whole house with his noise?' "'Why, it can't be Joshua,' I said, for I knew him for one of the most respectable young ghosts in the village. "'Joshua it is,' said shoemaker and one of these nights he'll find himself out in the street if he isn't careful. This kind of talk shocked me, I can tell you, for I don't like to hear a man abusing his own family, and I could hardly believe that a steady youngster like Joshua had taken to drink. But just then in came Butcher Alwyn in such a temper that he could hardly drink his beer. The young puppy, the young puppy, he kept on saying, and it was some time before Shoemaker and I found out that he was talking about his ancestor that fell at Senlac. Drink, said Shoemaker, hopefully, for we all like company in our misfortunes, and Butcher nodded grimly. The young noodle, he said, emptying his tankard. Well, after that I kept my ears open, and it was the same story all over the village. There was hardly a young man among all the ghosts of Fairfield who didn't roll home in the small hours of the morning the worse for liquor. I used to wake up in the night and hear them stumble past my house, singing outrageous songs. The worst of it was that we couldn't keep the scandal to ourselves, and the folk at Greenhill began to talk of sodden Fairfield, and taught their children to sing a song about us. Sodden Fairfield, Sodden Fairfield, has no use for bread and butter, rum for breakfast, rum for dinner, rum for tea, and rum for supper. We are easy going in our village, but we didn't like that. Of course, we soon found out where the young fellows went to get the drink, and a landlord was terribly cut up that his tenant should have turned out so badly but his wife wouldn't hear of parting with the brooch, so he couldn't give the captain notice to quit. But as time went on, things grew from bad to worse, and at all hours of the day you would see those young reprobates sleeping it off on the village green. Nearly every afternoon a ghost wagon used to jolt down to the ship with a lading of rum, and though the older ghosts seemed inclined to give the captain's hospitality the go-by, the youngsters were neither to hold nor to bind. So one afternoon when I was taking my nap, I heard a knock at the door, and there was Parson, looking very serious, like a man with a job before him that he didn't altogether relish. I'm going down to talk to the captain about all this drunkenness in the village, and I want you to come with me, he said straight out. I can't say that I fancied the visit much myself, and I tried to hint to Parson that as, after all, they were only a lot of ghosts, it didn't much matter. Dead or alive, I'm responsible for their good conduct, he said, 
and I'm going to do my duty and put a stop to this continued disorder. Are you coming with me, John Simmons? So I went, Parson being a persuasive kind of man. We went down to the ship, and as we approached her, I could see the captain tasting the air on deck. When he saw Parson, he took off his hat very politely, and I can tell you that I was relieved to find that he had a proper respect for the cloth. Parson acknowledged his salute, and spoke out stoutly enough. Sir, I should be glad to have a word with you. Come on board, sir, come on board, said the captain, and I could tell by his voice that he knew why we were there. Parson and I climbed up an uneasy kind of ladder, and the captain took us into the great cabin at the back of the ship, where the bay window was. It was the most wonderful place you ever saw in your life, all full of gold and silver plate, swords with jeweled scabbards, carved oak chairs, and great chests that looked as though they were bursting with guineas. Even Parson was surprised and he did not shake his head very hard when the captain took down some silver cups and poured us out a drink of rum. I tasted mine, and I don't mind saying that it changed my view of things entirely. There was nothing betwixt and between about that rum, and I felt that it was ridiculous to blame the lads for drinking too much of stuff like that. It seemed to fill my veins with honey and fire. Parson put the case squarely to the captain, but I didn't listen much to what he said. I was busy sipping my drink and looking through the window at the fishes swimming to and fro over landlord's turnips. Just then it seemed the most natural thing in the world that they should be there, though afterward, of course, I could see that that proved it was a ghost ship but even then I thought it was queer when I saw a drowned sailor float by in the thin air, with his hair and beard all full of bubbles. It was the first time I had seen anything quite like that at Fairfield. All the time I was regarding the wonders of the deep, Parson was telling Captain Roberts how there was no peace or rest in the village owing to the curse of drunkenness and what a bad example the youngsters were setting to the older ghosts. The captain listened very attentively, and put in a word only now and then about boys being boys and young men sowing their wild oats. But when Parson had finished his speech, he filled up our silver cups and said to Parson with a flourish, I should be sorry to cause trouble anywhere I have been made welcome, and you will be glad to hear that I put to sea tomorrow night. And now you must drink me a prosperous voyage. So we all stood up and drank the toast with honor, and that noble rum was like hot oil in my veins. After that, Captain showed us some of the curiosities he had brought back from foreign parts, and we were greatly amazed, though afterward I couldn't clearly remember what they were and then I found myself walking across the turnips with Parson, and I was telling him of the glories of the deep that I had seen through the window of the ship. He turned on me severely. If I were you, John Simmons, he said, I should go straight home to bed. He has a way of putting things that wouldn't occur to an ordinary man, has Parson, and I did as he told me. Well, Next day it came on to blow, and it blew harder and harder, till about eight o'clock at night I heard a noise and looked out into the garden. I dare say you won't believe me, it seems a bit tall even to me, but the wind had lifted the thatch of my pigsty into the widow's garden a second time. I thought I wouldn't wait to hear what widow had to say about it, so I went across the green to the fox and grapes and the wind was so strong that I danced along on tiptoe like a girl at the fair. When I got to the inn, landlord had to help me shut the door. It seemed as though a dozen goats were pushing against it to come in out of the storm. It's a powerful tempest, he said, drawing the beer. 
I hear there's a chimney down at Dickory End. It's a funny thing how these sailors know about the weather, I answered. When Captain said he was going tonight, I was thinking it would take a cap full of wind to carry the ship back to sea. And now here's more than a cap full. Ah, yes, said Landlord. It's tonight he goes, true enough, and mind you, though he treated me handsome over the rent, I'm not sure it's a loss to the village. I don't hold with gentrists, who fetch their drink from London instead of helping local traders to get their living. But you haven't got any rum like his, I said, to draw him out. His neck grew red above his collar, and I was afraid I'd gone too far. But after a while he got his breath with a grunt. John Simmons, he said, if you've come down here this windy night to talk a lot of fool's talk, you've wasted a journey. Well, of course then I had to smooth him down with praising his rum, and heaven forgive me for swearing it was better than captains. For the like of that rum no living lips have tasted save mine and parson's. But somehow or other I brought Landlord round, and presently we must have a glass of his best to prove its quality. Beat that if you can, he cried, and we both raised our glasses to our mouths, only to stop halfway and look at each other in amaze. For the wind that had been howling outside like an outrageous dog had all of a sudden turned as melodious as the carol boys of a Christmas Eve. "'Surely that's not my Martha,' whispered Landlord, Martha being his great-aunt who lived in the loft overhead. We went to the door, and the wind burst it open so that the handle was driven clean into the plaster of the wall, but we didn't think about that at the time, for over our heads, sailing very comfortably through the windy stars, was the ship that had passed the summer in Landlord's field. Her portholes and her bay window were blazing with lights, and there was a noise of singing and fiddling on her decks. "'He's gone!' shouted Landlord above the storm, and he's taken half the village with him. I could only nod in answer, not having lungs like bellows of leather. In the morning we were able to measure the strength of the storm, and over and above my pigsty there was damage enough wrought in the village to keep us busy. True it is that the children had to break down no branches for the firing that autumn, since the wind had strewn the woods with more than they could carry away. Many of our ghosts were scattered abroad, but this time very few came back, all the young men having sailed with Captain, and not only ghosts, for a poor half-witted lad was missing, and we reckoned that he had stowed himself away or perhaps shipped as cabin boy not knowing any better. What with the lamentation of the ghost girls and the grumblings of families who had lost ancestors, the village was upset for a while, and the funny thing was that it was the folk who had complained most of the carryings on of the youngsters who made most noise now that they were gone. I hadn't any sympathy with shoemaker or butcher, who ran about saying how much they missed their lads, but it made me grieve to hear the poor bereaved girls calling their lovers by name on the village green at nightfall. It didn't seem fair to me that they should have lost their men a second time, after giving up life in order to join them, as like as not. Still, not even a spirit can be sorry forever, and after a few months we made up our mind that the folk who had sailed in the ship were never coming back and we didn't talk about it any more. And then one day, I dare say it would be a couple of years after, when the whole business was quite forgotten, who should come traipsing along the road from Portsmouth but the daft lad who had gone away with the ship without waiting till he was dead to become a ghost. You never saw such a boy as that in all your life. He had a great rusty cutlass hanging to a string at his waist, and he was tattooed all over in fine colors, so that even his face looked like a girl's sampler. 
he had a handkerchief in his hand full of foreign shells and old-fashioned pieces of small money very curious and he walked up to the well outside his mother's house and drew himself a drink as if he had been nowhere in particular the worst of it was that he had come back as soft-headed as he went and try as we might we couldn't get anything reasonable out of him he talked a lot of gibberish about keel hauling and walking the plank and crimson murders things which a decent sailor should know nothing about so that it seemed to me that for all his manners captain had been more of a pirate than a gentleman mariner but to draw sense out of that boy was as hard as picking cherries off a crab tree one silly tale he had that he kept on drifting back to and to hear him you would have thought that it was the only thing that happened to him in his life we were at anchor he would say off an island called the basket of flowers and the sailors had caught a lot of parrots and we were teaching them to swear up and down the decks up and down the decks and the language they used was dreadful then we looked up and saw the masts of the spanish ship outside the harbor outside the harbor they were so we threw the parrots into the sea and sailed out to fight and all the parrots were drowned in the sea and the language they used was dreadful that's the sort of boy he was nothing but silly talk of parrots when we asked him about the fighting and we never had a chance of teaching him better for two days after he ran away again and hasn't been seen since that's my story and i assure you that things like that are happening at fairfield all the time the ship has never come back but somehow as people grow older they seem to think that one of these windy nights shall come sailing in over the hedges with all the lost ghosts on board well when she comes she'll be welcome there's one ghost lass that has never grown tired of waiting for her lad to return every night you'll see her out on the green straining her poor eyes with looking for the mast lights among the stars a faithful lass you'd call her and i'm thinking you'd be right landlord's field wasn't a penny the worse for the visit but they do say that since then the turnips that have been grown in it have tasted of rum End of chapter 12